Our speaker is an internationally renowned biointensive gardening educator and restoration grazing consultant. The season marks his 20th year growing and selecting heritage seed for vegetable production based on the work of Piers Curtis Stone from the Urban Gardener, sorry, the Urban Farmer, and Jean Martin Fortier, uh, the Market Gardener. His commitment to regenerative agri agriculture has created relationships with many of the world's leading figures shaping the direction of Roebuck Farm and influencing students around the world. He is going to tell us all about Roebuck Farm and why it's attracted attention from around the world. Please welcome Jody Roebuck. Right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, kia ora, good afternoon everybody. Uh, so my name is Jody Roebuck, I'm from New Zealand, the west coast, uh, Taranaki is the region we're from. It's very similar to here that all our, well the whole peninsula we're on was made up from the mountains blowing up and our mountains are still active so we're in the energy province. Um, a little bit, of, bit more about the region and our, and our climate, um, we're in the roaring 40s so it can be 140k southerly wind. Uh, that's our big challenge. Uh, we have 2.3 metres of rain spread over 10 months. I know that sounds idyllic, it's uh, absolutely not. We might have 100 days a year where we actually can't do any bed prep or any field work. Um, so I've been farming now 23 years and right across lots of different sectors. So, um, four years with a design background, I've worked in commercial orchard work for about four years. Um, I apprentice growing heritage vegetable seed. There's a huge gap there still. Uh, then uh, when my wife was pregnant I went on an uh, internship and worked with John Jevons in uh, North California and um, really started out in ag uh, with a real strong sense in sustainability. Uh, brought our farm in 04 and um, built built the farm up from nothing. There was nothing there as you'll see in a couple of the slide pictures. So it wasn't the family farm. I grew up in town. I didn't have a farming background. And that, that was my advantage. So is this the clicker for my pictures? I think that is. Okay. So um, I was given the title, Can Small Scale Farms Be Sustainable and Profitable? Um, and I'm going to roll with that one for a bit. Let's go on here. Um, so this is our starting point and uh, we were really excited about the aspect of our property. We brought it in 2004 and there was nothing there, not the house, no trees, no fence and we're in the valley. It's a sun trap, it's protected by the, uh, it was sheltered from our trade westerly wind. Uh, that, that valley shelf there is, is 20 metres above the river so we'll, Although we have 2.3 metres out the sky, we also have uh, water, great water security. Um, and we knew this in 1975, and this is key, people co still come to the farm today and tell us how lucky we are with our soils. Uh, in 1975, they pushed all the topsoil off the valley floor over the ridge. So we started on a severely compacted mountain ash subsoil with no organic matter. And, you know, with this focus on sustainability and we didn't have a gate but I shut the imaginary gate and for the first 10 years we brought nothing in. Uh, I don't recommend you start like that. And, but we learnt a lot and so there's our future fertility wrapped. We cut um, haylage and made unsustainable amounts of compost by hand um, in those first 10 years. Um, so so we're gonna, I'm going to tell the our story but also the story of um, you know, my mentors like Joel and, and many others that have um, helped us accelerate um, to get to where we are now and you know, we, we also pass um, what we've learnt on to others. So can small scale farms be sustainable and profitable? How long is a piece of string? Sorry, can you just on your actual boundary? On the oh the boundary we're from the ridge to the waterway. Um, so you can't see the ridge up here and we're, we're, we're seven acres. Yeah. 
Uh, I was vegetarian, uh, for 13 years I was vegetarian when we brought the land, I was just interested in that flat bit, and, and true story, I was like, how are we going to deal with the outer acreage? Like, ooh, this is big time. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, now, yeah, I'll come back to this one. Now, I'm going to um, quote a few um, things that are not mine, but are from other, some of my other mentors. One, this one's from Joel. Um, you know, we can all we can all do this, and, and we can all um, create an income off a piece of land. And this is what uh, I heard Joel say in Poly Faces: um, that you've just got to take the first step, and and you can't take the second or third step until you've begun and taken that first step. Um, so, well, this is going on. Of working off farm, growing our family and children, um, you know, still and working in farm related jobs. So I've been fencing, crafty, horning, um, you know, d doing gardening related work and travel. I was actually travelling, teaching the gardening work through a lot in um, Australia a lot actually. But um, I kind of got really interested in grazing as well. So I'm going to and include that thread in here. Um, so this is our starting point. No topsoil. No infrastructures. Um, ten years ago, I sold my skateboard to pay the power bill. This is uh, a bit more recent, maybe four, month, four months ago. And I'm going to talk about the journey of how we actually made our business not just sustainable but profitable. And so to, to get to this point here, remember on our, on our subsoil, um, I've, there's a lot of the foundations of what have um, made our farm work, and um, I guess it seems to be standing out to others. Um, the foundation work came from John Jevons, and uh, I've learnt from him the ability to transform uh, nearly any soil type into a deep living soil. Um, air is the key component, and also um, carbon, and recycling that carbon through a long, slow called compost process. Um, and so we set to work in uh, developing these beds and doing a lot of, a lot of composting. Bef before we embarked on the market garden, I knew that we needed to improve the soil and we did a lot of cover cropping in the off season. This is when I was um, traveling and working in, you know, off farm and uh, my kids were very young. And once we deepened our soils, we were able to, um, we, we cover cropped, and when the cover crops were mature, we pulled them out manually, um, and that was very labour intensive, and composted them. But the um, the amount of root material they were able to put into the soil was significant in, in transforming our soil. So that's our no input, low cost, but very labour intensive um, strategy that we we employed. Um, you know, that's a there's no chance for weeds or impact on the soil um, um, here. And we're sequestering carbon and recycling that in our compost piles. And in the summer season back then, I was also um, growing and selecting heritage vegetable seed. But I actually never got to the point where we marketed the seed because I had no business sense. And I do a lot of public talking back home and I say, how can we grow the country if it's not mandatory to do accounting and business studies at school? which is what my 15-year-old daughter is now doing. I said, it doesn't matter if you want a toenail pa painting company. If you've got no business sense, you'll never be, have a business. So to be continued there. So the cover cropping really built the soil and um, also gave us time off, for, well, me time off when I was travelling, teaching, and also to build the infrastructures on the farm because, you know, you can't, can't sail the ship until you've built it. Uh, introducing now Jean-Martin Fortier, the market gardener. Um, we hosted um, JM for short. We hosted JM and another um, another farmer called Curtis Stone, not the Australian chef, but the Canadian market gardener, uh, for an event. And we looked after them, fed them, took them to the beach, and so on. And they both invited us to go back, or invited me to go and work with them and um, see their production. And I, so I, I did that straight away that that August and spent a month with them. And it was one of the best things that I did. Um, you know, you can learn a lot on YouTube, reading books, but actually um, the farmer to farmer um, 
you know, learning really uh, just sped up the, the process for us. And so I got the market gardening bug. It's like suddenly I want to be feeding people. And um, a couple of things that um, Jean-Martin Fortier particularly has, has popularised and has really helped us over on our farm. Um, the, one, the one thing he, he says, and this is my question, I'll see what your answer is, what's the one thing you don't have on the farm? Someone say customers. Has anyone got any other ideas? Animals. Uh, we, we, we had them by now. It's time. Yep. And we, I really, that one really struck with me. Um, and so one strategy, um, amongst lots of other things that Jean Martin's made popular, is um, is one. Uh, well, let's show you his farm. This is the new research farm he's working on. Joel, I think you've been there too. I've I've worked here. I've actually done work with the great with the sheep on on another farm, but. Mr. D owns this farm and JM's running this project. 450 beds. Um, I love this one. The agronomist said in, in the early days, you can't grow food here. They're, they're turning over 20k a weekend at the farmer's market. That's just at the market. Um, so this small scale, this is still small scale, it's four acres or less. Um, this movement is moving so fast, it's a part-time job for me just keeping up with the R&D, the new innovation, um, the new tools and, and the new possibilities. It's now viable to make an income on a small piece of land. Um, JM is one of the most generous sweetheart guys I've ever met. First trip there he sent me home with um, uh, a Jang cedar, a precision cedar and a tilfer. Um, so. And JM has also popularised um, tarping. So there it is. It's a bit of <laughs> it's a bit of black plastic, and uh, it's getting used for another purpose here. But this is the easiest way to start to start breaking a new ground is just to lay out plastic over your grass to kill it out. It's like an employee. It's working for you, and lots of m magic happens under there if you create the right environment. The worms come in and have a party. Um, and we do long season tarping, so we now chop and drop those cover crops, lay, the, lay down the tarps, and we're basically composting in, in situ. Uh, we typically do that over winter, we do it in summer as well. Um, JM's really popularised this, and it's a great way to um, save time. Let's see what comes up here. And so this is a new block we developed. Um, Curtis actually really liked what we are doing because I developed my seed gardens with a rake and a fork. And Curtis said, hey, I'd like to come back next year and we'll run an introduction to market gardening um, class. And you, know, you, you get it set up, we'll, we'll come back. And he also made us an offer we've never had before. He said, we'll go halves in the proceeds from the event. So all the teaching I do abroad, I get a daily fee. So this is the farmer to farmer support thing that I'm kind of starting to talk about. Um, and I know Daniel, Joel's son, calls it passion transfer. That, that really identified with me as well. Um, so what we've, the help that we've received from other farmers is, is um, we wouldn't be where we are without that. So i really like to acknowledge that. This is what that looks like after the tarp came off. Now, our soil is so compacted um, that I actually went into town and hired the rotary hoe. And I know that I didn't want to be going down deep our soil is so compacted that the rotary hoe just bounced on top. All I could do is bust up the grass crown, it would only go five centimetres deep. So I busted up all the new ground that we are going to develop the market garden in, took the rotary hoe back, put the tarps back down. We have no tractor, no plough, no walk behind tractor on the farm. But we do have this tool here, which JM gave it to me, it's a tilfa, and it does all the surface cultivation. It's run off a, a Makita battery drill. And so as I uncovered the tarps, I was able to bust, bust up the organic matter and put the tarp back down. And so this is just a matter of minutes to get up and running, um, you know, to, to kill out the grass and, and get ready to begin broad, um, broad forking. Five days later, and we're in production. With transplants are coming out of the greenhouse, um, direct seeding with the Jang cedar, our precision cedar. And you know, we're, we're 
not far off being ready to sell food to people. Curtis Stone, the urban farmer, this is his passive solar greenhouse um, in Kelowna. Uh, that greenhouse cost him $30,000 to build. In the first growing season, the crops that he grew in there um, paid for itself. So he, with this um, support from him, well we knew he was coming back. Um, so we did a 100 day working bee with a whole lot of um, support help on the farm. And we put up a new greenhouse, built the washroom, and developed um, about 40 new growing beds, so we doubled the size of our production, just in time for Curtis to turn up uh, for this event. And although Curtis farms on a third of an acre, he's become one of the most influential um, farmers in, you know, in the small-scale market gardening movement. And um, I'm going I'm to share with you um, what I think is some of that magic. One is um, he, de he developed a crop rating value and this is really significant because um, he scaled up to two acres, uh, nine staff, 90 crops, two and a half million turnover, no, no quality of life, and he, he tracked everything. And he's big on the Pareto principle, 80-20. And he worked out 80% of his income came from 20% of his crops, 80% of his income came from 20% of his customers, so he backed out of that two acre lease, continued with his backyard leases, and was doing 120, in a six month growing season, 120,000 turnover on third of an acre on other people's land, no, no mortgage. Um, and so the crop rating value is, would be different for all of us, but it's, it's been um, key in the development of our business, and I'm seeing its influence on other types of production also. And so Curtis's crop rating value is um, number one, DTM, days to maturity. He only does fast days to maturity crops. Number two, multiple cut. Number two and three could be reverse. Number three, high value. Number four, popular. And there's the pattern to be able to grow an income in a small area. So he was doing about 20 different types of crops and he actually simplified it back down to, I don't know, 12 or 15. And so I went and worked in his farm and you know, experienced the tools, the crops and the washroom. Came, came back home, it only took me 30 minutes to design the rest of the farm, the layout and the washroom, um, which is a key part of the business. We'll, we'll come to that. Um, so the DTM, the days to maturity, is a, is a key thing and still in the market gardening movement, um, people like growing a wide diversity of stuff but my friends with the market garden, I love them, we have complementary products but they're just doing long season low value crops. So let's look at some of the crops. It's leafy greens, L lettuce is a good one and the fact that we can, half of its life perhaps is grown indoors in a, in a tray. Then we bring it out as a transplant. So the time it takes to grow a transplant at the moment, we can all, all, already have grown a crop of radish in the field in that same bed that the lettuce is going to come into. So it's um, pretty high value. But there's also faster crops like microgreens. And so we just rolled with Curtis's business model. And three years in, on less than half of an acre, we're now turning over 120,000, which is, you know, that was his benchmark. And I can see that we can um, double that income with, with no more area. And I'll, I'll talk soon more about our retail. Um, microgreens are fantastic. They, so that we track the DTM on our farm, the days to maturity. And the microgreens got as fast as four and a half days in summer. But $80 a kg. So, and we've got two new tools, the very basic, one is a drop seeder, it's like a perspex box with the bottom and top plate. And the, both plates have got holes in them and it's offset. You shake the seeds on it, you push the top plate across and it drops the seed onto here. It's actually not invented for microgreens, it's for a, a transplanting tool in the field. And so what we're seeing is all these new in innovative tools actually have multiple purpose. Um, and we're using the greens harvester, which is a, another tool for in the field for, um, it's basically a, a cloth catcher with a blade at the bottom 
and ropes that spin on top. It's powered by a battery drill. And so you can just run over your greens and cut them. And it's just taken all of the work out of hand harvesting greens in the field, except for lettuce. And so we, we just made a little wooden ramp. And um, I saw this from in Oregon, from a farm called Excelsior Farm. And I he actually just shared it on social media. And he called it Microgreens Motocross. And he's just got a little wooden ramp and used the greens harvester to just cut up the ramp and, and cut, cut the microgreens. So it's, in the last 12 months, we've been using these strategies and it's made our microgreens tenfold more um, time efficient. The beauty of these crops is they're so fast, you start to think next week gonna be short on lettuce or mustard and mazuna in the field. You just put in another sowing of micros and you can fill out. So I'm not here to talk you out of um, planning, but I don't do any planning. And you know, we had a, um, what do you call it, a, the, the ultimate storm for, for lettuce. Um, lettuce doesn't like the heat. We had um, some really hot weather. Uh, we had an uh, insect was starting to eat them. We had a volunteer that did some rough sowings. A new client that wanted $500 of lettuce a week, and suddenly we're like, where are we going to get our lettuce next week? We now do three sowings of microgreens a week, and I go to bed at night, no worries. It's like counting gra grazing days ahead, you know, in, in a tough time. This is our buffer. I just love the things. And the other thing we also, by having um, th the microgreens do, is they give us flexibility. So we can, we've got about eight types of salad mixes that we do. And I might be a little prompting here, a little early here. Um, I was kind of told or brainwashed a little bit that in small scale agriculture, you've got to be the middle person every way of the step. And I think we've got some really strong relationships um, with our, where we sell in town. We actually um, have three retail shops in town that sell on behalf of us. One is uh, the independent fish shop, or they're called uh, Egmont Seafoods. 30 year family business, 26 staff, they do wholesale fish distribution and their shop front, just down the road from us, they have 1,400 walking customers a week. So um, another farmer that's taught me a lot, and I know Joel works with them too, Darren Doherty, he's, a, he's an Australian. Um, Darren's mentored us a lot and one uh, philosophy or strategy that Darren has, um, we, we embraced, and that is we go where we're invited. Um, so Egmont Seafoods approached us, they brought us a fridge, and we now have a complimentary, um, you know, our item is complimentary in their shop. Um, every week's our biggest week of, t of retail in there. Uh, we also are at TLC Meats, the largest independent butchery in New Plymouth. So it's, you know, it's meat and veg the Mediterranean um, high-end supermarket, and every week is the biggest week for our business, last week included. Last week we did about $4,000 of um, basically salad, so some carrots, but mainly 90% of that were in salad turnover. And this is from half an acre, and we still haven't you know, scratched the surface. Um, but the key thing with retailers is the relationship with them. We just love them. And they also work on a small margin. They work on a 15% margin. and you know, we, they, have, they tell us stories like they have, our customers are coming in to get salad and buying fish now. And the Wednesday market we go to, we take the fish for them. If by chance we don't sell some salad, we just give it to the staff. So we, we, um, we're really big on creating flexible systems for us on the farm and also zero waste. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to that. Let's, uh, let's go and look at the washroom. So on the 100 day working bee, we made the washroom. We got it live the night before Curtis Stone turned up. And uh, it's insulated, it's south facing. And as Jean Martin Fortier says, 40% of your work um, on the farm or the market garden is harvest and post harvest. And so we built this before we bagged our first bag of lettuce. The black um, tub there is a spa bath, that's where we wash the lettuce. And then we spin it in our custom salad spinner. You've all got one at home as well, it's a washing machine. <laughs> and then those fans are on a, they drop up and down and the screen, um, so basically we, we grade in the field as we cut and then we wash it and dry it. And what all of our customers are telling us is that our, that our salads are lasting two weeks. So this room is key for our production and if we, 
if we doubled our turnover or doubled our area, this washroom will so still support that. Um, so we spent a, a, a lot of time in here. And th the event we ran with Curtis Stone paid for us to put this washroom up. It wouldn't be up otherwise. Um, so there's the drying screen. And we're also, um, this bottom trolley down here, we're, we put wheels on everything, so there's no lifting, everything's modular. Um, these stacks of crates slip inside each other or on top of each other, so we can make mobile benches for everyone to work around, if different heights, different um, needs around you know, in the washroom. Um, everything's very, very portable. And back to um, creating zero waste, in, in the washroom there's two other things that happen. One is, um, well actually one, one is on the side of the walk-in chiller we have um, the farm map of all of the garden beds. It's a whiteboard with the, you know, the beds on there permanently and that's where we track our DTM, our days to maturity. And so the micrograns that were four and a half days, they're now six and a half days. The field mizuna was as fast as 18 days, it's now out at like 47, 48 days. And so by tracking our DTM, and we've got our 18 crops that we just continually sow, that's my mantra, just keep planting. We track everything in the field as we sow it, so we know the volume of seed we're putting out, um, how many rows, um, the settings on the, on the precision seeders, and um, these tools are also small, and a couple of trips I brought them home on the aeroplane with me. Like the, They've, they've just become indispensable. And uh, most of them are designed out of North America by Elliot Coleman. Um, the six row seeder, the greens, quick cut greens harvester, um, the tilter, that's the battery powered baby plough that does all the surface cultivation. And I worked on Elliot's farm for a week in July on my sabbatical. He just had his 80th birthday. And he's, a few things that he said to me, one was, um, I would have started a tool company but I never would have been able to farm. And so he just passed these on to other people to do the R&D on. Um, and a, a couple of things that came up on the first talk this morning. Um, this is a, a, a quote from Elliot too, I think it's really interesting. He says, farmers are expected to purchase everything at retail and to sell their produce at wholesale. That, that really hit me. So in, in winter we don't do any wholesale because the DTM is 250%, we don't get 250% more price. So that's why we love retail. Um, so let's go on to this next slide. So also um, creating f flexibility in our harvest processes is, has been key for us. And this you know, cheap whiteboard um, is how we create zero waste and it also um, determines what mixes we're going to make and where they go. Now I have a couple of key um, relationships with a few of our chefs. We have um, five restaurants on the books, but especially two chefs and their orders that they have, I have to know every morning what they need on our two harvest days to be able to set that aside. And then what nobody's talking about in this movement, everybody's talking about planning, nobody's talking about what does the field give you. Once we've harvested and we know, okay, we've got six totes of lettuce, four totes of mizuna, a tub of micrograns and um, let's say two tubs of pea shoots. Once we take out us, um, the, what the, the restaurants want, we then can say what mixes are we going to make today and the beauty of retail is we can take any of our mixes into there and we just keep them stocked. So um, this board, um, you can see the crops along the top, is, goes in the order that we harvest and um, put our mixes together. So the pea shoots are a single item, the radish microgreens are a single item. Together with um, mizuna microgreens, they're a rainbow mix. Then we have our lettuce mix, our mustard and mizuna as single items. Together, the salad mix. Add the, all of those together, that's leaves and shoots, which is our Rolls Royce salad, which we just won an award for at the outstanding. New Zealand Food Producers Awards. Um, and so, and then we have our, our retail, our restaurants, and our markets. Um, so this, this is at the bagging table, and right behind this is the farm map where we track our DTM, where we log what we've just sown in the field. 
So when we harvest, we come into the washroom, and with one glance we know, oh, the mizuna's now out at 35 days. Um, here's a little story um, about carrots. One of our chefs, um, they're an award-winning restaurant in town, um, and the, the front window they have taxidermy um, animals hanging in the window, and so, um, some people love it, some people don't. Um, we've been supplying them salad, and they asked for carrots six months ago, and we said we don't have the volumes that you need at the moment. A month ago, we were at that point where we had the volumes they wanted with the carrots, so I approached them, I said, hey, we've got, I said, Blair, we've got the carrots now. He said, great, because um, there's, uh, did you know there's a nationwide shortage in baby carrots? I was like, no, I didn't, didn't know that. Um, so it's good timing. I said, so what's, um, what's the price that you get you know, from bid food for your carrots? He says, 17 55 plus GST. I said, we can match that. <laughs> so uh, first delivery, everything goes all good. Second delivery, he's like, come over here, I need to talk to you. He says, um, those carrots that we were getting from bid food, he says, uh, do you think they'll be heritage? He says, because when I cook them, all this black stuff comes out of them. I says, no, they're definitely not heritage. And now I don't think that black stuff is compost. He says, your carrots are amazing. When we cook them, um, they, so they, I think they, they blanch them and then roast them. He says, your carrots, like they stand up, they don't break down, and obviously the, the, the flavour, you know, it's a taste of difference. I don't think we need about a zap our food to read the um, nutrient density. I think we've already got one of these inside our mouth. Um, and so, yeah, really, um, it's fascinating seeing you know, the big chain supply um, and the, the, what the chefs at uh, uh, the restaurants that want is local food from someone with a strong brand that can be consistent. And the fast days to maturity crops are a lot easier for us to achieve that. Um, we also uh, graze sheep, and I, I breed my own sheep. Um, we, we, we can talk more about that soon, but um, I looked in the w front window of this restaurant at all the taxidermy, and it's ducks. Um, there's a baby goat. And um, so one of my um, best breeding ewes, um, we don't name our sheep, but she's named, she's Granny Texel. She's just turned 12. She's low frame score, beautiful animal. Um, when it's time for her to go to heaven, we're going to taxidermy her and put her in the front window <laughs> of the shop on the one way, so when I'm driving down, I can toot and... <laughs> yeah. So we really love some of our chefs. And you know it's the relationship. Um, so this is the bagging table. There's that chart. Um, so yeah, again, the the our retail relationships are key, uh, and and with the chefs. You know, if I talk um, with one chef, for example, they they do a lot of mustard and mizuna. On the menu, it says Robot Greens. So what happens when we get tired on mustard mizuna? I talk to him and he says, no worries, just bring us any type of salad. It doesn't say mustard mizuna on the menu. So, you know, same with the carrots. I can, if he wants 15 kg, I've only got time to get 10 out the field before deliveries. He knows I'm gonna bring him another five on the next delivery a couple of days later. Um, everything is easy with them. I can't say that about all chefs, but, <laughs> There's no chefs here, right? No, really. Um, it's we make a bit, a bit of money off the re, off the restaurants, but really our money is is, is in retail. Um, so yeah, we're a small farm with big impact. Um, we're very small. We're about half an acre of production. Last month we won three awards. Uh, we won a gold medal at the Outstanding New Zealand Food Producers Awards. Um, that's my partner in the middle, Tanya. She runs a lot of the business, the parts of the business that you don't see um, in the field. She teaches art history full time at a girls' school. Um, she built the website. She does all our marketing, all our correspondence. Um, the farm we wouldn't be a business without her. Uh, and we also won the sustainability award, which is a pretty, pretty big thing um, at this event. And the other um, award that we won last month was at the. Balanced Fertiliser Sustainability Awards. We were up against some really um, large-scale um, 
you know, some really amazing farms, sheep and beef typically, and we won the People in the Primary Sector Award. Um, I was a little, uh, had a giggle to myself, I was a little bit confused because the, you know, the Balanced Fertiliser Awards, we've never used any fertiliser on the farm ever. <laughs> so now, um, Darren Doherty, I don't know where he got it from, but I heard him say once, you can't be green if you're in the red. That really sunk in. So we were, used to do all of these long season cover crops that improved the soil, but they didn't put any cash in my pocket. And they're very labour intensive. Mum used to actually help pull them all out and get them in the compost pile. I, I, I want to share this one with you. This is my favourite field crop. It's pea shoots. One kilogram of dry seed soaked overnight. That's five dollars. Um, it's spread out on the on the garden bed, and then we put the um, we water it and we put the ply down and as much weight as we can get on it. We force germinate them. And then we take the weights off, and, and when the shoots just before the tendril jumps on the neighbour, we actually hand harvest these ones. We turn that five dollars a seed into fifty-four plus GST. We've got GST on food in New Zealand. Yeah, I don't think you do in in, in Whole Foods. Not on fruit Yeah, yep. So sixty dollars a kilogram for these peas. This is where. For us, sustainability meets profitability, or where the green meets the red. By the time we harvest these shoots, they've put a foot of uh, root material into the ground. Very quick to plant, and they, we sell them by themselves, and we put them just about every salad mix. Um, and when we're finished with them, we then tarp them. So our basic crop rotation, which we just do in the field by eye, is compost, leafy green, leafy green, root veg, Cover crop, tarp. That's how that's how easy it is. It, yeah. So and they also give us flexibility. Same thing. If we think we're going to be short on, you know, in a fortnight's time, we just double up on pea shoots out in the field. Really exciting about um, peas. And this is you know we we trained last year. We had two thousand people through the farm. We run twenty six sold out events, and we also run a market gardening class. This is the way to start your market garden, microgreens, pea shoots, straight into restaurant, <coughs> you know, very little infrastructures, and, and you're, up, you're up and running. There's the pea shoots, let's have a look here, um, rocket, we're also using um, lots of other strategies, we have no crop insurance, this is our insurance, it's uh, insect net over these hoops, um, it stops the you know, the white butterfly from annihilating the brassicas, but it also stops heavy rain and wind taking out the leaves. Uh, we use 70% um, shade net on the ground um, for everything that we direct seed to germinate under. This makes a huge difference. You know, the, we cover our soil at, at all times. Public enemy number one is bare soil. And uh, remember some of the, I didn't show you too many photos, but the, all these new tools and innovation mainly a lot of them designed by Elliot Coleman. Now he's just turned 80, he's retired, he's still the first one farming each morning. It took Elliot 45 years to design this. And it's the greatest, um, I think, farm invention I've seen It's a wire hoe. In the afternoon when the surface soil's dry and the weeds are tiny, that just sits on the ground and between your rows you're just walking. Like, it's very quick. I bet he wishes he invented that about 40 years ago. Um, so sometimes innovation's right in front of our face, and it's a, it's a really simple answer. So there's the farm from the air. Um, now Joel, I did a four-day regenerative agriculture practical with Joel, amongst a few other courses in 2012. The, super excited after that. The, the week I got home, I tripled my acreage. I started grazing the neighbourhood. Uh, I got up to 100, we're, remember we're seven acres, I got up to 130 sheep on other people's land, no money involved. Um, so, you know, basically everywhere you can see up there, I'm, I'm grazing. And, in here. Yeah, so I actually, um, it wasn't until we took on the salad business that um, I actually came back to the garden. Really love um, cows and sheep. 
as Joel says, sauerkraut vats on legs. And uh, been, uh, been blessed to, to work with and see uh, you know, a lot of grazing around the world. Uh, so we no outside inputs with our sheep. We, we graze them on a tall grass. Our recovery periods are 90 days in warm season, 120 days in winter. In winter. Move them every day. With 16 species in our pasture, we didn't seed any of them, including uh, the strawberry clover, which is not seen in Taranaki anymore. The seeds in every paddock. And these are, this is the breed of sheep that I've been breeding, especially this, um, this sheep second from the right. Look at the shape of her, Texel. And we've put um, Cheviot over them last year. And so the, the, the real management tool for, uh, um, with, you know, with this high density grazing is they become non-selective in their grazing. Remember we had 2,000 people through the farm last year. I had a, a farmer turn up and he made a beeline for me and says, he says, oh, you've got to keep that lamb. I says, why is that? He says, it's eating gorse. I was like, they, they all do that. But that's non-selective grazing. They don't completely get rid of the gorse, but they stop it flowering. Um, so we have no facial eczema because we're never eating down low, even though we have a, a very high spore count in our region. Um, no fertiliser, no outside inputs. What else is going on? Our ewes, we're grazing and breeding up until they're 10, 11 and 12 because we're not wearing the teeth out. And the next generation, look at this sheep at the front here, that's with the cheviot crossed over them. Um, do all my own butchery, eat the whole animal, Western A price, thank you very much. Um, so the first time I met Joel was in the back of the car. Darren had just picked me up. First time I met Darren Doherty too. And I was like, oh no, there's Darren and Joel. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, when they'd finished having the catch up, I, I, I got brave enough to say to Joel, because I knew when he was younger he had sheep. I says, um, so Joel, do you still have any sheep? And he sat up, bolt right, turned around to me and he goes, goats are too smart, sheep are too dumb. And I was like, oh no. I said the wrong thing. Um, I'm going to finish up with a 45 second video of us moving our sheep. I've got really, I'm really influenced by Joel and a lot of other graziers, um, you know, Greg Judy, and, and you know, I wish I had a big cattle farm as well. Um, really big on low stress stock handling, and you know, you don't, you don't have to be big to, to work out a lot. We've got a lot of people watching us. Um, I really don't believe this idea that sheep don't eat taller grass. They prefer seed heads, flowers, and broadleaf. That's their preference. Um, we haven't cut hay in five years. We did cut some this year. Um, graze them all year round outdoors. And uh, you know, it's all about when grazing's done well. A, a mentor of mine, Bruce Davison, he's actually in New South Wales. Does anyone know Bruce Davison? Yep. Bruce hit me up. He says, you know, your pasture looks nice and not this particular one, and your, your plant and density is really nice, he says, but actually it's all about what it looks like when you move off the paddock, the residual. I was like, thanks. So this is sheep mulching. And, you know, the more your recovery, the higher stocking density, the more control you have over your landscape management. And, um, yeah, I, I begged to, I, I don't think sheep are stupid, you know. They know my car, they know my trailer, they'll get on it voluntary. A sh one sheep can, uh, know, can remember 50 human faces. That's half of this crowd. So we're, we're nearly there. Um, so yeah, 2,000 people through the farm last year. We're also on the New Zealand farming program called Country Calendar. Does anyone know Country Calendar? Just had half a million people watch what we're doing on there, including low stress stock handling. This is uh, Stratford Primary School. This is last Thursday morning. There's a hundred of them, eight hundred eight-year-olds. That's more tiring than farming. <laughs> and um, you know, this is the this is a, this is a while ago. This is the after that hundred-day working bee before Curtis. That's Curtis teaching a class there. But um, so we're, we're half an acre. We're now turning over one hundred and twenty thousand. I think we can do double that, and we're going to put a big greenhouse in that field. 
next autumn, we've already got the contract to go into Pack and Save New Plymouth. We'll quit our two farmers markets because they're just hobby scale and we'll be 100% in retail with a few restaurants. Um, the sky's the limit. We've got two acres of flat land there that we couldn't produce salad from. Right. Awesome. So just got a 45 second film. Is that, a, 